episode of the Great Girls of Canada podcast, Beers with Brandon. I'm your host, Brandon Leslie. We're here in Halifax, beautiful Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, for our annual summer meeting, our first one in person since 2019. Uh, and as you can see, I've got a couple of guests. We're trying something new. I've got two guests for this podcast here on location, and one of my favorite beers is Alexander Keys. So when in Halifax, what does one do? We go to the brewery. <laughs> here we are at the beautiful Alexander Keys Brewery. Um, and I don't know about you guys, we'll, we'll, get, we'll dive into a little bit of beer, but this is, like I said, one of my favorite go-to beers. Great venue, great guest. But I'll give you a bit of a, bit of a background on Alexander Keith. So after learning the brewing trade in, from his uncle in England, Alexander Keith emigrated to Halifax in 1817 and became manager at a brewery, which he later bought in 1820. In 1822, he moved it here to the location we're at today. This is a historic building. We just finished a tour earlier before our, before our meetings. One of the best tours I've ever had of a brewery. Just a, a fantastic tour. Uh, in 1841, he was elected to city council in Halifax and was elected mayor in 1843, 1853, and 1854. In 1843, he was appointed to the Legislative Council of Nova Scotia, becoming its president from 1867 until his death in 1873. Now, Keith's is I would say probably by far and away the most popular beer in Nova Scotia, and thankfully, uh, not all of these kinds are available in Ontario, but I do dabble a little bit in the, the regular IPA uh, here in town. So uh, I'd like to thank, first off, the, the folks here at Keys for supplying us with this, this great venue, uh, offering us a tour before, I like it, a fantastic tour, and supplying us with a couple of beers for our guests and our, our live audience here today. Yeah. We're, we're doing this, I feel like Oprah. We've got a live studio audience over here. It, Oprah never uh, gave away free beer, though. That's <laughs> a, no, Oprah also gave away free stuff. I don't think it's free beer, though. Um, but so my guests today, they're they're on the opposite sides uh, politically. They're on opposite sides of the aisle. Um, but they're both, I would say, two of the strongest advocates for agriculture in Parliament that we have here today. And for that, I, I really do appreciate uh, and thank you for that. So may I start with you, Cody? You're the local-ish. Uh, from just north of here, representing the riding of Kings Hans, Nova Scotia. Uh, first elected in 2019, and you were immediately put on the Agricultural Committee, uh, Agri Agriculture and Agri-Food Committee. Uh, and then last year, you were named the chair. Uh, a bit of a, a, bit of, a bit of a pay bump, I guess, too, but a little bit of an extra work and, and a few responsibilities that are, are a bit unique. It's an interesting role. Um, and you have a bit of an interesting riding insofar as probably the only riding in Nova Scotia that really grows a lot of a, a lot of things. So uh, you're also the chair of the Liberals uh, Atlantic Caucus, so 24 MPs uh, representing uh, Atlantic Canada in the National Caucus, uh, former chair of the Liberals Rural Caucus, which I know you're still very much involved. Um, so thanks so much for, for being here today, Cody. This is, this is fantastic. Thanks so much for hosting me. It's great to be able to join John and you and have a good discussion today. I think we're going to have some fun. Yeah. And uh, it's great to see and be part of uh, your summer meeting here today. And, and to be at Keese, uh, you're right. Uh, I'll be careful because we've got, as the political response in Nova Scotia, <laughs> we have many great uh, local beers. Uh, but I think Alexander Keese is well known. And the history that you just read off, uh, I think, signifies how deep and ingrained uh, the beer and the culture has been in Nova Scotia, so uh, thanks to Keith for hosting us. Thanks. East Coast hospitality. I've heard of it, now I've experienced it, and if you're ever in Halifax, like, this is this is the place to come. You come for a tour, like I said, this tour was unbelievable. You come for a tour, a taste of some of the fine beverages, and a little bit of a taste of that, that East Coast hospitality. So thanks so much for making the, not too long of a trip down, but one of us did make a bit longer trip from <laughs> nearly the other end of the country. Uh, representing the riding of Foothills uh, in Alberta. Uh, John Barlow, Member of Parliament, was first elected in 2014 uh, in a by-election. I think he replaced Ted Menzies, Ted Menzies in a by-election. That's, right. yeah. that's yeah. right. Riding McLeod, that's right. if I recall correctly. Good Scottish name. Yeah, yeah good Scottish name. <laughs> uh, and so then you were re-elected in 2015, 2019, 2021. When was the last yeah. election? I've lost track of yeah. elections. It's been too many lately. Yeah. <laughs> just one more. Just so, one more. <laughs> John, uh, before before you became a member of Parliament, uh, you were uh, an award-winning journalist uh, with the High River Times, uh, as well as the associate publisher and editor of the Okotos Western Wheel. Uh, you were born and raised in, in rural Saskatchewan before moving over to Alberta to raise your family there, which 
uh, your wife Louise, uh, and three children, Graydon, Kinley, and McKenna, uh, living in High River. So thanks for making a, a pretty good, a good reason to make a track for the yep. GG summer meeting. Yeah, just uh, right. GG summer meeting as well as just uh, you know, hang out in a great well, I just want to thanks. see Cody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not going. Parliament's broke, so you know, we're, we, we, we're now going to put away the talking points. We're going to have a beer. We're going to have a bit of a casual conversation. Um, obviously, you two are, are well versed on, on agricultural issues, so we're going to dive into some of those. I think there's some uh, philosophical questions about you know, where we are as a nation and some of the challenges facing facing our sector. But I often find, you know, working in politics for a while, a lot of people, you see each other chirping at each other across the House of Commons, and it all seems that that's the way politics works. But it's really not. Thankfully, I don't think I'm going to have to pretend to be the Speaker of the House of Commons here and, and referee you two. I know you get along uh, quite well together, yeah. uh, and, and so I think we're, we're in for a good conversation about you know a, a variety of topics behind the curtain, how you got here, who you are, what you believe, and, and so I appreciate your willingness to, to sit down with a beer and uh, are ready to kind of talk about the world and see going. what's going on. Thankfully our guests are having a beer, so they're going to be able to put up with it too yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, so, Let's start with something that unites us. Canada. We, 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 we quibble. We, we're divided politically at times, it seems like. But Canada Day unites us. I would say it's the best country in the world. Others from other countries, I'm sure, would disagree. But I think I can all agree that it's, this is the best country in the world. So, Cody, this is your first year as a member of parliament outside of a pandemic to celebrate Canada Day, I think, by, by my math. So, what is what is Canada Day like? Canada Day like as a member of Parliament? Uh, and this is being your first one. What'd you do? Well, look, uh, well, a whole bunch of activities all through the day, and you're absolutely right. Um, look, whether or not it's the best country in the world uh, doesn't really matter. We're very fortunate to call Canada home, uh, and I think over the last couple of years, uh, there's been challenges, but you know, we're here, we're together, and uh, notwithstanding some of the challenges we've had, we have a lot to celebrate, and so. I don't want to speak for John, but I, politically, uh, Canada Day is one of the most important days to get out and try to be in as many communities as possible. And King's Hands is just shy of 5,000 square kilometers, so it's it's not like you can be in every single nook and cranny all at once. Uh, but I started my day in Halls Harbour. For those that might be watching the podcast, that's a beautiful little fishing community on the Bay of Fundy. Uh, we had a breakfast. Uh, we went then traveled to the UNESCO Heritage Site at Grand Pre. So, to talk about the importance of agriculture and how Acadians actually shaped uh, our agriculture sector in the Annapolis Valley with the dike systems. For those that are here, go down and see it. It's gorgeous. Uh, spent some time in Wolfville, did a parade in Hansport, and then finished off my day a little bit closer to home uh, in East Hans. So, I did have that opportunity to do Canada Day as a candidate in 2019, uh, but it's extremely important, and it's important that we celebrate everything that we have to and I, I really appreciate you being here today, not because it's Canada Day related, um, but because you're getting married in, I want to say, four days, yeah. Saturday. Yeah. Um, I'm, his so, best, I'm his best man. That's gone wrong. That's where it goes. Told a speech out here. Yeah, yeah. You guys will I, tell me if it's good I, or not. I love to hear So. What do you uh, what do you do for the rest of the summer? I, I hope you take some downtime after that. I think after being allowed to come and visit us here, and uh, you had, I understand you have people coming in from out of town on maybe the white side or the yeah, other side. Yeah, uh, look, my fiance's from Scotland, so her family on her father's side is over uh, for three weeks, and so it's been nice to be able to show them around. Uh, of course, uh, it's nice to be back in person in Parliament. I mean, John has had at least five years of that being in the normal routine. Uh, you have to remember I was elected in 2019 and then it was March of 2020. So we might have had eight to ten weeks after that parliament had started before it was kind of, you got to go home and, and we were doing everything virtually. So you can't replicate being in Ottawa. Uh, there are, I think, perhaps some tools and some uh, benefits that we can incorporate into modernizing parliament, but I like to be there. Uh, but I will say I'm excited for a little bit of downtime. Uh, obviously, my fiance, as I mentioned in my remarks earlier before the podcast, I want to get around and see some different places of the country. I'll have to negotiate that with her and make sure I don't... Uh, John will know all about that. He'll have to give me the secrets. Uh, but uh, no, I'm excited to have a little bit of downtime. But it's still important to be out in the summer and hear from people, right? You call it the barbecue circuit, but it's having the chance to be involved and present in your communities because that's what people expect their elected officials to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
John, it's you. What's the secret? <laughs> you, know, you survived a tough life. Members of Parliament, it is a, it is a tough life, Members of Parliament. Yeah. How, how, what's the secret to a happy marriage as a member of Parliament? Well, yeah, first off, and, and Cody's going to learn this, uh, you, you, can't, you can't do it without the support of, yeah. of your spouse and your family. And the, the ironic thing is there's a few things that we have in common. My, my wife is also born in Scotland, so uh, we do have a couple of... So I would just... Be aware of the Scottish temper. <laughs> it, is, it is a little frightening, and uh, so I just be careful. Know the signs when it starts to come. But honestly, you know, I, I take uh, I take my wife when I'm home. Um, I'm home, and uh, you know, we, Sundays is our is our family day. We don't do anything on Sundays. The constituents understand that they appreciate it. Uh, but just on Canada Day, you know, we we were up at five thirty to start hitting the road and. She tags along with me. She may sleep in the, the car for an hour or two here and there, but uh, she's as much a part of it as, as I am. And I always like to say it's, uh, you know, it's not just me, it's, it's a team. And, uh, you know, having her with me and, and shoulder to shoulder at all the events, and, you know, obviously the last two years have been uh, a bit of a grind, and, you know, mentally, physically, um, but to have her every day when I go home or when, every weekend when I get home, it's, uh, it means a lot just knowing that she, uh, she understands what I'm going through because she is right there, goes along with me. So you chair the Scottish Friendship Group in Parliament. Is that's that why? Right. Yeah, that's why. Do you just like Scotch, or what's the story? Well, I do like Scotch, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I've, uh, I married into the, the Scottish heritage, for sure. Um, so we, you know, we've got a lot of family in, in Scotland still, so we make a pretty regular trip over there every couple of years just to see, see the family. And uh, the, the first time I went, actually, was for her cousin's wedding. And it was also her uncle's, so my uncle's uh, 50th birthday. So he got 50 bottles of scotch for his birthday from all his friends. So uh, I, I, I had to sit down and try them with them. You know, it's, it's, it's a good uh, nephew would do. So I definitely found a, found a liking to scotch after uh, after that day. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's become a big part of our lives for sure. We we chaired the Highland Games in in uh, High River for 10 years. And I just my daughter's Highland Dance, so it's it's been a big part of our lives for sure. Well, it's, uh, I have Scottish ancestry and uh, the Leslie Castle, and I, it's on my bucket list. And I'm going to look you up, and we're going to figure out some of those tips and tricks of what to do in Scotland, including golf, which I, I saw you do yesterday, so maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> oh, low, low. <laughs> um, what else? So, Sam P, you have a pretty big excuse not to go to Tempe. Yeah. I'll give you yeah. that. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting out there. The greatest outdoor show on earth. It, it, it really, it's amazing. I, my first one was last year, uh, yeah. the pandemic one. Uh, and I well, thought, that's not really. I thought it was unbelievable. I was like, this is the best, right? Uh, so you're at Stampede coming up, I'm sure. What else you got going on this summer? Yeah, Stampede's going to be pretty, uh, pretty, pretty busy for the next 10 days. Uh, I think this Stampede is going to be unlike ones we've had in a long time. It just uh, as you probably have seen, people are just ready to, to get out and enjoy life again. This is going to be our first stampede where everything's back to normal. The chuck wagons are back. You know, I, I grew up with a lot of these guys, the cowboys and chuck wagon drivers. Um, you know, that's a that's my favorite part is, is just going to see the cowboys and, and their families back behind the barns. Um, but you know, the Alberta economy is really taking a, a positive turn, uh, so I think. People are really gonna get let loose, and then the rest of the summer, like his barbecue circuit, mine's kind of rodeo circuit. So we've got rodeos in all of our little towns and, and markets and parades. I think I have 16 parades to the summer. Um, so it's a great opportunity to, to shake hands and see folks, and uh, people are just—you can just feel the weight off people's shoulders now, and they just want to get out yeah. and enjoy life and see their family and see their friends. And uh, we on, on Canada Day, one of my favorite things is uh, the Millerville races, horse races in one of the small towns. And I think this is its hundred and. 30th year or something like that. Uh, we have kids races in between the horse races and me and a couple of buddies, we, we've, all, we've run them for a while and we usually have 12 kids. Well, there's like 50 kids at each race and we're like, oh my gosh, we don't have enough stuff. Like, we don't have enough prizes, we have enough. It's really scrambling. Uh, thankfully, I had, a, as I'm sure Cody does too, a truck full of flags and can of pins and stuff. So we were hawking this stuff. Sorry, we don't have enough candy, but I have a pin. They were quite happy. But, yeah, it just showed that uh, the, the people are ready to get out and enjoy life again. That's really key. When you go to the parades, you have to have enough candy. Like if you look at the Apple Blossom Parade, which again, Apple Blossom was incorporated in 1933, and so it's like 7,000 people through the uh, basically the number one highway into Kenful, and you always have to have enough at the end because you don't want to have any tears when, uh, when you can't get to any candy at the end of time. You're a politician. You can't have crying kids. <laughs> it's, a real, it's a real problem. I don't think so that's Bulk Barn is sold out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'm glad you're on top of that. You've learned your lesson early without even having to go through the pain of, of having 
your crying children. <laughs> yeah. So before we get into some of the, the politics and, and ag, I got one other question for you fellas. You're both hockey fans. You're both goalies, <laughs> which <clears throat> I haven't met many normal goalies. So like, <laughs> who knows to you guys? Uh, sorry to the goalies out there that think they're not nuts, but. Uh, have, have you guys played against other? I know there's MP hockey. I've, I, I've shot a couple meager shots at you and then you stopped. Uh, have you guys had a chance to play against other? Or what's we haven't. I've seen John's photos with him and you know, all his gear and stuff like that. So I should correct. I was a goaltender. Played at, uh, was fortunate enough to be drafted actually to the Halifax Mooseheads here in yeah. town. Played some university hockey. I've now transitioned to a good stay at home defense. <laughs> so I look, forward to, I look forward to taking some, uh, well, frustration wouldn't be the right word, but if, I, if, if, if John says something snide in the house, maybe I'll take a good shot on him the next time. Oh, when we go back oh, MP hockey gets to me if I recall. Well, well, yeah, yeah there's, there's, there's an issue with why we haven't faced each other. Is, uh, uh, we, we did have a charity game, I think, in 2016 uh, after, that, after we lost that election. Um, <laughs> Some frustration uh, released. Yeah, we, we got a, a player lost a tooth, a liberal player, and uh, we it was a charity fundraiser for Terry Fox <laughs> Foundation, if I recall, at the Scotia Bank Center in Ottawa. Uh, so we, you know, we had a few hundred people there, not, you know, not a big crowd, but seven minutes left in the game. The ref said, "That's it, it's over. <laughs> you guys are a gong show." Uh, <laughs> who, who, who won with the seven minute mark? Uh, well, I don't want to rub it in, but we uh, we won I think nine two or nine three. Oh. Yeah. So they made a better goalie, or better say on the well, pass. Right. So the problem was, every penalty was a penalty shot, and they had oh. just Roger Cousiner put the same guys for every penalty shot. I stopped every one but one. So all right, uh, that's a bit, doing, yeah, I don't know, bad coaching. Yeah. So I, I did. I you, you mentioned you, you were with the Mooseheads. I think I looked you up on Hockey DB. Uh, and I think you've been in New Mexico. Did you play some games down there? Yeah. Like, look, I I had been drafted major junior here in Tampa. Um, had. Had a good academic background, so was looking to play NCAA hockey in the U.S. Uh, there was a couple different pathways. So you could go to British Columbia. The Alberta Junior League is, yep. is one of the top leagues. Uh, Maritime League, top-notch hockey, but not always was viewed at that time when I was coming through towards that pathway. So I went and played in the North American Hockey League uh, for a relatively short period of time in New Mexico, and it was exactly what you would picture. <laughs> <laughs> it was in a little suburb called Rio Rancho outside of Albuquerque. $40 million facility called the Santa Ana Star Center, but there was cacti and everything around. It was actually a very difficult place to want to get motivated to go inside the ring and play yeah. hockey. Uh, but no, I had a great, look, I was able to meet so many great people through hockey, and John, I'm sure, could say the same, and we continue to meet people that way, and uh, notwithstanding that, I guess the Conservatives would have beat us in 2016, we'll have to, we'll have to get a match together in the fall. I revitalized this. Well, we're, we're, we're talking about doing it again, but maybe mix, mix, mix the, the teams, teams up yeah. rather than... Okay. Oh, yeah, on I don't know if there's any NDP who plays. So <laughs> that's, 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 that's not a knock. I just don't, you know, I don't know if there are any. But. You mentioned the AJ. So I, I'm an Avalanche. I'm a Colorado Avalanche fan. And so Cam McCarr. Yeah, I, 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 I beat my Oaks Oaks Oilers many, many times. He is so good. I'm still positive from that victory. I had to do a bit of an Avalanche plug. Sure. Sure. But well, when I looked you up on Hockey DB. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Cole Herbert, come on, Ethan McKinnon, that's my reward. Kevin Carmine. Anyway, yeah. we'll, we'll leave that aside. But I looked up hockey. DP. But the Alberta guy won the consummate, just so we're clear. That's right. And the Norris. <laughs> you had two. You had two seasons as a goaltender with 20 minutes of penalty. Short. <laughs> <laughs> was it ten twos or four fives? No, well, it was a bit of a mixture. Probably, uh, probably a few. I like to play the puck. Uh, like Marty Berger and the way he used to play, so I would get out of my net quite often. There was probably a couple, uh, you know, overzealous uh, trying to find the puck that might have went out for two minutes, uh, but I didn't mind to, to use my blocker. <laughs> no, no, there, no. So, That's the story we're trying to do. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm well, thinking of run going into the corner and <laughs> came up swinging, is what yeah. happened. Yeah. 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 Nothing wrong with that. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, you guys are good nuts, right? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Uh, so we'll move into why, why on earth, let's start with you John, why do you do this? Like, it's, it's, a, it's a frank, honest question, but like, you know, when we, and it's probably getting worse, so maybe I'll get you to comment on, on that. The, the time away, you talked about the Sundays with your wife, I mean, not many people have that reality where it's like, well, one day a week, that's got to be our day, and a lot of people do, but it's tough, you're traveling, you're getting just chirped on Twitter, I'm sure. It, why would you sacrifice? Why are you going to uh, Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Probably what I've asked myself a few times. But uh, well, a don't go on Twitter. 
Uh, that is very good for your mental health. Um, I have I have a Twitter account. My staff monitor it. I, have, I don't go on it. It's not worth it. Um, message to all of you. It's, it's not worth it. Um, but being an MP is worth it. Uh, it is an incredible experience that the people you meet. And obviously, you know the unfortunate thing: people see question period and they think that's what it's like, and that's not what it, for those forty-five minutes or an hour. Sure. Um, but you know we're sitting here. Cody and I and Francis get along extremely well. Uh, at the committee level, you, you have, and I, that's, I really enjoy the agriculture committee because it's unlike most of the other ones where there is some, some gamesmanship and some partisan stuff going on, but for the most part, very rarely does that happen with us because we know we have to work together to try and try and get things done. Uh, front pack labeling was a, was a good example. We, we were able to get that exemption for ground beef and pork, and we uh, wouldn't have got that done if we all didn't work together. And, you know, Francis and, and uh, Cody, I know we're behind the scenes. I can be a little bit more aggressive, certainly. But um, So when you have those wins, it makes a lot of it worthwhile. But honestly, and the thing that people overlook a lot is what we do in our constituency offices. Um, you know, I have an incredible staff, and certainly right now with passports and, and immigration and CRA issues, like, we have two people in there that are just flooded. But when you get something fixed for someone, you get their passport or you get their permanent residency resolved or they, they get back into Canada, um, they're so thankful. And most people don't even realize we do that stuff, but that's the stuff that, um, that really I, I'm proud of our team that we're able to, to get that done. Now initially when this was no grand plan for me to, to do this, uh, when Ted Menzies, who was phenomenal, uh, you know, tough, tough shoes to fill for sure, and one of the, the biggest advocates for agriculture uh, in the country certainly, great that I have folks like him and Kim McConnell and guys like that in my riding, but um, but I, I just had all these people say, you know, I think you'd be really good at this. Why don't you give it a, give it a try? And initially I said, no, I, I don't want to go to Ottawa that much. I, I love my home and you know, my kids. And uh, But my wife, she said, you know, I, I think if you don't do this, you'll never know when you get the chance again. And if you don't do it, you'll regret it. And she was right. And again, to have her beside me and encouraging me, uh, pretty tough nomination process as, uh, yeah, as we go through, like that, sure. and uh, so, yeah, and I haven't, uh, you know, I can honestly say I don't think I've regretted it a single basis. It's good to hear. I mean, it's interesting you say the constituency staff, um, I, they do, you know, we, this Ottawa staff has got all the credits, actually the constituency staff that do all the hard work <laughs> to make people actually better off uh, on the whole, but um, what about you? Like you, you left, you were saying you were a lawyer down the street here, you had yeah. a great life in a great city. <laughs> Uh, blossoming hockey career. Yeah. Geez, <laughs> uh, it was no, why, why, would, why would you, why, at a young age too, you know, why would you do this? The Wolf Hill Lumberjacks were calling. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, for me, and it might sound cliche, if you would have been, I got elected at 28, so relatively young uh, in parliamentary speak. Um, if you would have seen me 15 years ago, you would have said this is probably the last guy that's ever going to find him in. And I know that sounds cliche, but my dad drove a truck. Uh, my mom's an administrative assistant at the local school. Uh, mom is still the type that knows that I'm on Team Liberal, but couldn't really tell you the difference. And she wouldn't be embarrassed. If this is just her reality. She wouldn't know the difference between Liberals, Conservatives, and NDP. She just knows that she, I'm on Team Liberal, and she should probably check that box. And then I <laughs> should. Oh, yeah, <laughs> should. I don't know. Maybe she doesn't. Um, uh, but no, uh, I didn't grow up in a family that was going to political AGMs at a young age. Um, I was heavily involved in sports. Uh, hockey was one, softball, fast loop softball was another. That's big in the western provinces, I know. We, we spent many times uh, going out west to play ball. Um, and really, it was sport was my whole connection to community at a young age. And it was, uh, I was taking a commerce degree here at St. Mary's University in Halifax. Uh, took my first political science class and went, I love this. Uh, and made a conscious choice at a young age not to get involved in, in, in partisan politics. I, I wanted to find some time to identify where I fit on the political spectrum. Uh, I always say there's kind of three reasons why I was drawn to the Liberal Party. Uh, one is I'm a centrist, that's not a very sexy answer, but I do see myself kind of ideologically in the middle of the, of the political spectrum, which uh, traditionally the Liberal Party has, has occupied that space. Um, the Prime Minister talked a lot about middle income families in 2015 and coming from a, a family where we were paycheck to paycheck. Uh, that was something that really resonated with me. And, and finally would be Scott Bryson. I mean, you mentioned Ted Menzies uh, as someone that you could look to as a mentor and a real advocate. Uh, Scott was here for 21 years, both as a progressive conservative and as a liberal. Uh, was well respected, uh, remains well respected, and really, uh, you don't fill those shoes, you just see the mold and you have to create your own mold. So, 
Uh, I, you're right, I, was, I had just been started my law career at McGinnis Cooper, enjoyed it, uh, but always had those side projects on the side of my desk that were community-based. I had started a couple different nonprofit organizations, and for me, you know, John mentioned this, uh, yes, hats off to my constituency staff as well, Tanya, Michael, Christina, and Riley are here. Um, they're the ones that do a lot of the heavy lifting for us as members of Parliament. Uh, we can't do this without a, a support uh, system at home as well, so to my fiance Kim. But it's about helping people. Uh, politics matters. Uh, the decisions that are made in Parliament have consequences, uh, both good and bad, depending on how you see it, uh, to people. And so if you are passionate about that type of work, uh, what better role than to be able to take on the work as a member of Parliament and try to help influence uh, and, and drive positive change? That's a good reason. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this, I, and I suspect it's maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like you're both accidental Aggies. I mean, you were a journalist, you, you come from rural Saskatchewan, so you have a background, and you come from a very rural riding, yep. an agricultural producing riding. What did you want to fix when you became an MP, though? If it wasn't ag, what was it? Yeah, you know, we had just gone through the 2013 flood, um, which devastated a lot of communities in my riding, and, and I just at that time, I saw uh, Stephen Harper come in with no fanfare, no one knew. He came in, him and Loreen started swapping out basements and moving stuff around, and Ted too, for that matter. And, and uh, you know, talked to him for a little bit there, there that day. And again, I was not, not I'm much like Cody. I was not a card carrying member. I was not a, you know, go rallies and things like that as a journalist. I couldn't. Um, but I had a really com conversation with him. Like, we need to fix this. And, not only repair High River and Black Diamond in Calgary, but find ways that, that this doesn't happen again. Um, so that was really my, my big impetus when I when I came in was to, to do some of the flood remediation. Very proud of the fact that we were able to do a lot of that work uh, in just a short time in, in government after that. Uh, but we also had the, the firearms seizures in High River as, after that, which uh, frustrated me to great lengths that that, that happened. So there was a, a couple of things. and. And obviously, growing up in rural Saskatchewan, and again, you know, most of my life in rural Alberta, uh, all of my friends were farmers and ranchers. You know, I'm helping at harvest all the time, helping at branding season, calving season. So I've been involved in it for, you know, from when when a neighbor needs help, you call a neighbor and you answer. And that that mentality has always been a big part of my life. And so it wasn't exactly maybe a specific thing. It's just that mentality. Uh, when your community calls on you, and my community called on me for this. Um, I just felt it was, uh, you know, if you have the support, the confidence, uh, and the trust of your friends and neighbors that you can do this, then, you know, you answer. Sure, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, it's an interesting point. The community aspect, and I'm uh, from the farm, and, and our neighbors are, you know, half mile away as the closest one. And yeah. So, one of the you might not like your neighbors, <laughs> <laughs> but you darn well are probably going to need them someday, and vice yep. versa, right? Yep. And, I hope and your so, neighbors aren't listening. <laughs> 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 they don't like <laughs> but it's one of those things, right? Like you'll, you'll, it, it, well, we'll dive into this in the urban and rural, but I think that's it's it's, it's uniquely rural. You know, yeah. you're from rural riding, so are you. It's not so uniquely, but it, it is it is a factor uh, here at the end of the day. Um, but one thing I'd, I'd ask you guys, as those un unlikely Aggies, Aggies, I should say, you, you came in. What have you learned about agriculture? Ideally, grain, because you know, grain yeah. grows. Uh, you, you're surprised, or you think most things don't know, even to this day. What, what, what is that? And Cody, you went to Saskatchewan. Yeah, sure. Well, I, a couple of things. Unlike it, I was probably more likely than you might think. Uh, King's Hands, uh, as, as was mentioned by uh, some of the folks in this room, uh, has a real wide diversity of agriculture. We, uh, we do have grain growers. Uh, we have uh, a world-class fruit growing industry, horticulture, also the most supply-managed farms east of, east of Quebec. Uh, I used to date the dairy farmer's daughter when I was playing junior hockey. You got out of there. So, uh, yeah, with, uh, yeah, I'm very happily going to be married in four, uh, in four days. Uh, but well, yeah, in, a, in a past life, uh, it was a dairy farmer's daughter. Uh, and we also grew up next to a dairy farm. So agriculture was pervasive uh, in, in my life at a young age in a, in a positive way. And, and indeed, the economy in King's Hands is driven by agriculture. So, I mean, that's kind of the dynamic that I bring to Parliament. Um, on grain, look, I, to be fair, the breadbasket of the country through the grain lens is, is the prairie provinces. And I think the beauty of being a member of Parliament, John can speak to this, I know he spent time in the Maritimes and it, the issues and opportunities would be different. 
Uh, but having the chance to get to Saskatchewan and just see the innovation uh, and the level of commitment to driving rural communities uh, and, and really the sense of pride that I would say, particularly, well, the whole country, but indeed Western Canada, plays in not just feeding Canada, but feeding the world. Uh, there is this ethos or this spirit that it is, it's not just about what we're doing here in Saskatchewan or Manitoba or Alberta, it's that what we're doing here is truly putting food on the plate around the world. And uh, it's not to say that I didn't already understand that at a, at a high level, but to be able to see it on the ground was uh, really refreshing and it was, it was important for me to be able to see it and I'm looking forward to getting out and doing more of that. Well, you are welcome to come visit my family <laughs> farm in Manitoba. We will, we will, my parents will happily host you there. And yeah. I know, Brendan, you talked about earlier in your, your speech about uh, uh, value-added processing, uh, a rural plant plant just in Santa Cruz, Prairie, Manitoba. Brendan's with our Manitoba Pulse Growers. I'm sure we'd happily uh, arrange that. So I want to, I want you to come out to uh, see Manitoba too. We're, we're, we're sneaky good at farming. <laughs> sneaky. <laughs> you, you, you touched on a really good, a very important point and something that we have to focus on. Cody mentioned a little bit in, in his speech is, and you were mentioning urban versus rural, you'll get to that, but I, I think our job, or one of the most important jobs we have now, is to educate Canadians about what modern Canadian agriculture is. And I think, unfortunately, too many Canadians have this picture, and I don't want to just say urban, but, you know, the, a lot of it is, they have this picture in their mind of what they think farming is. Yeah. Um, and it's it, it, it's so distorted of what actually is going on. I think for, for me, one of the things we have to show Canadians is the innovation, the technology, but the care and and commitment that they have to protecting their soil, protecting their water, protecting their livestock, that's their livelihood. Uh, as farmers, they're, they're not destroying their land. They're certainly not trying to harm their consumers because that's, that's their, their business. So for me, uh, to go across Canada and you just see um, the care and uh, attention to detail that they take to, if they can find a way to be more efficient, they will find a way to be more efficient. Uh, if that's using less inputs and less chemicals or, or uh, you know, less fertilizer, you know, precision agriculture, all of those things. Uh, and there's, a real, there's a, such a massive gap between what is actually going on and what Canadians believe is going on, where their food comes from, how we do it. And what I would say, too, is it only takes one bad Netflix documentary to write. Oh, for, you know what I mean? Like, like, uh, to be <laughs> fair, um, you know, we, we consume our information, our news, and our knowledge in different ways. Uh, and and to, to John's point, sometimes there is a gap. What I would say the silver lining has been uh, of the pandemic, there's perhaps a couple, and, Obviously, I know it's a very challenging time. It's the first time, I think, in a number of generations that Canadians have really taken a moment to identify where the food comes from and understand the importance of the food supply chain in Canada and indeed around the world. And I think that's an opportunity, to John's point, that all elected officials, indeed uh, folks that, are, that care about these issues, try to impress upon people that attention to detail and that care that is being taken and, and to uh, demystify some of the stuff that can be blown under proportion by, by one bad Netflix documentary. I think that, that's a great point. I think it's a bit of a different lens on where your food comes from. Yep. You know, it is, well, not historically, and not to this past, it was it was a concern about is, is my food being, how it's being raised or grown, which is fair and rightful, but now it's like, well, where is my food coming from? It, it, it's a different shift in, in food security. But I think it's a, it's a reasonable question. We live in a time now where myths, urban myths, Conspiracy theories. Like there, there is a ton of misinformation, disinformation, whatever it is, as it relates to food, is now it's let's we'll call it out there, you know. And and it's whether it be a documentary or, or whatever else. You, as politicians, have diverse constituencies, both in terms of the national scale as a party and you know locally. You have you have to deal with very diverse viewpoints. And I think agriculture has struggled with that understanding of how to communicate effectively with Canadians, that story of how the things we all in this room know, but we haven't done a great job of it. So what advice would you give us as a sector, as folks that have very diverse constituencies within your constituency, about communicating in a way that is clear and makes sense and can be understood and digested Pun not intended. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, how, how, how do we do this better as a sector? So the opinion public. Look, I I would challenge the assumption that the agriculture sector 
hasn't done a good job of trying to be transparent and, and getting that information out there. I, I think, uh, at the end of the day, um, in the world of social media algorithms, of um, anyone can post anything, you know, the Internet of Things is a great thing because it allows for free speech and that, that kind of decentralization of message. It can also be problematic in the sense that anyone can spout off about something they don't have any idea about and somehow it could be taken as, uh, as credible. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, politicians included, uh, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, um, at the agriculture sector is already doing a good job uh, in terms of highlighting what goes on. It, it is important for all of us in leadership positions, I think going back to John's point, uh, to continue to highlight uh, what we know to be true uh, on the science base. And I know even on the science, you know, sometimes there's arguments about, you know, taking certain information and driving certain errors. Um, but we all have a responsibility to be proud of what our farmers do, proud of the agriculture sector. And I would say it's not just about highlighting how important it is in the world. Undoubtedly it is, uh, because when we look at farm gate production, it is rural Canada. The jobs, one in eight jobs in the country, are tied to agriculture. And all those jobs are not in rural Canada, let me tell you. A lot of those really good jobs are in urban Canada. Um, and so we need to make sure that this is just not a rural urban question. Yeah. This is a national issue. Uh, this is a national industry that is not only an important economic driver, uh, it puts food on our table. It's part of national security. It's part of food sovereignty. There is so much intrinsic value in the sector. And I think celebrating that is important. It's a hard question, though, to be fair. Uh, but I, I, I don't think we should necessarily... That's not to say that the agriculture sector should rest on its laurels in terms of what it does. But I don't think you should beat yourself up that somehow you're not doing a good job. It's tough. It, it is tough. Yeah, Next got, question. So sorry, you, you, just, you just have groups out there who are like Dumarag and, and some that are trying yeah. to, to share that message. Um, and you, I, I always kind of compare it to the energy sector where... Uh, they, they, for too long, they kind of suck their head in the sand and say, you know, if we just lay low, no one's going no to pay attention. We all know what happened there, and they're playing catch-up. So it's good to see agriculture being, you know, with documentaries like uh, Guardians of the Grassland, yep. Food yep. Evolution. So we, we need to share that with our public schools, just like when they're showing Food Inc. and some of these other ones. We also need to do that. But just to, I, I think government also has a role to play here where we are a partner with agriculture. So when Health Canada comes out with a decision that glyphosate is safe, there needs to be a massive marketing campaign behind that to show why Health Canada has made that decision. It's science-based decisions. But don't just put out a little press release and say, oh, by the way, glyphosate is safe and blow this. You need to be a champion and a partner and an advocate with agriculture to share that information widely with as, as many people and media outlets as you possibly can. Yeah. I, I had a very interesting and heated argument with my aunt who lives downtown Toronto about about glyphosate and she's like oh my god this is good. It's killing us all I'm like no no it's not I'm trying to walk her through it but she has this idea in her head and I'm trying to show her the you know the, the science and the data and Health Canada's report and um, so I think obviously agriculture and the stakeholders have a role but the government also should be there helping to augment that message, especially when they make yeah. good, sound, science-based decisions. That's a great point. I mean, and the language on a health panel on that glyphosate decision could have been stronger. It could not have been more clear, which is excellent. But you're right. For the tens of thousands of communication officers that work for the federal government, <coughs> like, how do we not have 11 in agriculture trying to do something like that, right? Like, I think, I think there, there's a government of Canada message on my TV all the time. Yeah. So why was that not part of that market? Are you a, you know, it's not Cody's fault, it's to help are you not proud of that decision? Yeah. Or are you like quietly, like, eh, we know we're going to take some heat for this decision? If it's a science-based, data-driven decision that is right, what's to be worried about? Get out there. Well, again, science doesn't seem to matter. Yeah, that's really, the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me defend the argument. No, it's not. It's not. No, it's not. No, no, it's a department official who made this decision. Oh, no. Cody must. I, I, I think John has a point about, uh, about government playing a role in trying to um, elevate science-based decisions and, and, and give credibility to them. I think it's a bit of a rabbit hole about, you know, how we would put that on TV for every well, science-based yeah, decision. Yeah, but yeah. I, yeah, I take fair, John's fair, point. Fair. I just want to meet on the middle there, right? That's my job as a centrist. The centrist. The centrist. The centrist. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's reasonable. It's my job, being reasonable. My job as the, as the chair is to bring all those disparate views together. <laughs> right? Oh, I thought we put this talking about 20 years ago. Come on, no. Uh, John, I just, you gotta switch beers. Oh, uh, I'm out pace. Yeah, he's out pace. Yeah, but you already <laughs> spoke. I just have to do that. Because <laughs> then, yeah, fine, fine. 
The next question is, is, is similar, because I think the question is, okay, Canadians are tough, what about government? You know, I think that, well, a couple things. One, it's fair to say that farmers and government over decades haven't really seen eye to eye on a lot of stuff. And I think that the same problems we see, in, and it, it, it's not rural-urban, I think you, you, you highlighted that well, it's, it's not, because it's, it's informed and misinformed, I would say, bluntly. And it doesn't matter where you're from, you could be anywhere with, the, with those views. But I think that that is arguably just as acute and more important when it comes to government officials. And a lot of these folks that, that work for the uh, Environment Climate Change Canada or AFC, I don't begrudge them for never having been to a farm because most people have never been to a farm. Like it, just, they've lived their life in a city or whatever city and, and that's their life and that's fine. But they're ultimately now impacting the folks in this room with their decisions, the way they write their, their policies and programs. Like it, it is, it's, it's becoming, I think, more and more challenging. So the same question as relates to how do we talk to the public? Well, how do we talk to government? How do we improve our, our, our ability to speak with government and, and not, you know, I can talk to you guys and get it. That, that's fine. And, and there's lots of members of parliament and senators that fully have a great background. They understand. And I don't need to, I'm preaching to the choir, as, as one would say. Yeah. But there's many that they, not only do they not represent farmers, they, they simply can't understand farmers at both the political and non-political level. So how do, how do we as a sector, as an industry more broadly, uh, communicate to government? You know, obviously, it's it's a bit of a challenge in that um, you know, and I'm not I'm not trying to be partisan here, but it's just fact. Like most of the MPs that are in government right now are are urban, so they they don't understand. But I you know I don't want to make light of it, but we almost need to have an exchange program, right? Like, yeah. you need to, yeah. okay, uh, you from Mississauga, you're going to spend some time in uh, rural Manitoba, and you're going to take a tour. But you know that's that's not their more, more than likely that's not their interest. Um, but I, honestly, for, for me being in opposition, um, I rely on Cody and Francis. You know, we'll have some side conversations and some texts, or we'll go for a beer and say, "This is what's going on." And, and I don't want to put talk out of school, but they will also tell me, like, "Hey, yep. uh, you know, we've done this, or this is what's what's coming down. We're trying, we're trying." Um, but I, you know, I don't know if there's a, a different tact you can take. You just I would say this, I guess, is sometimes ag stakeholders spend a lot of time talking to the ones who are already there. Yeah. Uh, you need to spend way more time with those urban MPs, block. And how do we get them there? That, that's, the, that's the other problem. No, I don't. One thing, like, yeah, and yeah. the reality is you guys always say yes, they always say no. Right. How do we get them? How do we get them to the table, so to speak? I'll weigh in on a couple sure. of things that you yes, said. Sure. Um, I think it was smart how you said, uh, and, and let me, let me, validate what John just said. Uh, the, the challenge politically right now in the country, and I, I don't think this is any secret, is the Conservative Party needs to be able to make more inroads in suburban, maybe not downtown, but certainly suburban ridings and, and, and GTA, Montreal, Vancouver areas in order to form government. Uh, we have the inverse problem if we want to get back to a majority government, which is we need to be able to resonate and win seats further outside of downtown. So there are areas of the country, and, and I'm not speaking out of turn just to say that we have some certain blind spots. We hold zero seats in Saskatchewan. There's large swaths of uh, the Prairie provinces in southwestern Ontario where we don't have representation. So to John's point, there are conversations that happen about uh, that, that information sharing about how best we can drive interests on that side. But I would say in terms of uh, sometimes frustration with stakeholders in government, that has existed since Confederation, yeah. right? Uh, there is always going to be the job of an advocacy group is to advocate to the full interests of grain growers of Canada, dairy farmers of Canada, whatever the case may be. And sometimes you're not always going to get what you want. Indeed, we as members of Parliament don't always get what we want, uh, but it's about trying to advocate the issues. So there, there is that information exchange. I don't know if you would call it... Uh, I think that's the responsibility of members of Parliament to do exactly what I know John has done and what I've done, which is go see other parts of the country. It's a big country out there. And I don't expect that what happens in King's Hands is necessarily a reflection of what happens across the country. Uh, you need to get out and understand how the best to move those issues. I think, uh, I think John is right about trying to engage outside of the cadre of the, of the willing that are already pretty, pretty entrenched in, in your camp. Uh, to the extent that that is possible, I think that's important. And, and also, leveraging members of parliament that also share these interests 
you know, John, there might be some interest, there might be some conservative caucus members that are more urban based. How do you get them in? And what can we do as Liberal Caucus, uh, where we don't have large rural numbers, but be able to draw in more urban advocates that do share those same uh, and the, values? And to Cody's point, there, there have been wins. We, we, off, we don't off, often talk about the wins that we have had. Front of, talk about front of pack labeling, uh, C234, the car tax. Now, I'm not going to. Cody and Francis made the good decisions on that. Now, sure. not third reading, but at least they're not fighting it. They're letting it go through, because, and I'm, I know they're talking to their counterparts. Uh, my. Uh, bill on biodiversity and protecting the biodiversity on farm, that was going to go through. Uh, so by working together, we have been able to get certain things through. Not everything, but um, when you do have a group, like I, like I said, that does work well together and does understand you know, the give and take there and the compromises, but we try work together for the greater good. And those are just three quick examples off the top of my head where we have had some, some pretty big wins. Well, listen, if I could have you guys be the ones making decisions, <laughs> I'd be a much... I'd be much happier, man. <laughs> it, would, it would be really easy. But you'd be out of a job. Uh, <laughs> so I happily lose my job for the betterment. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Aaron, did you hear that? Okay. If we just won, I quit. It's fine. We're done. Um, no, but I, I guess the question. So, you know, we, I'd like to move on to environment because that, that's the elephant in the room. It's around. You know. And you said it during your speech earlier, Cody, which I appreciate kind of that acknowledgement that these environmental policy and agricultural economic policy can certainly come to a head. And I think it's a matter of how do you try to mesh them in a way that there's most success possible. And in particular, for, for the agricultural sector, that, that is a challenge. It goes back to what I said, the farmers are not always getting along for, for decades. This isn't, this isn't unique to this government. This is just, this is just government. We have real challenges right now. Um, whether it be stock market falling, interest rates rising, input prices rising, and general food insecurity around the world. And we're lucky in Canada. We, we probably are pretty insulated to actual food insecurity. People face that absolutely in Canada. And, and probably will to some extent with rising food prices. But compared to where the real problems lie, they, we're, we're, we're lucky. Um, so there's real challenges. And, how, how do we have an adult conversation about this? How do we have an adult conversation about, yes, climate change is an existential threat, but to people around the world, immediate hunger is much more immediate. You know, how, how, do, we, how do we try to balance a, a conversation where we're in a position where some countries, many, 170 have signed on to, to the you know, climate change commitments of, of net zero emissions by 2050, and Great Rose of Canada, uh, you appreciate appreciate that. You know your, your acknowledgement earlier that we've we've committed to to working to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. We know that we are a part of both. We're, we're, we're a part of the solution, and so you know I think both in terms of reaction from from a farmer perspective, what they're facing on the front lines, and in terms of our policy objectives, we're aligned with government. But we just come to heads on so many of these issues. How do we have an adult, grown-up conversation about increasing production while also trying to do our part to fight climate change? Because both are actively happening right now. So I'm gonna. I, there's a number of things that you've said and that has gone on that I want to say, and then I'll turn it over to John. Sure. We'll have some back and forth. A um, couple things that going back just before we get to the conversation on how we square environmental policies with the world that we're facing today. Um, what I have found, and John might be able to validate this, is that the issues that the folks in this room and indeed many others across the country face are less coming down through agriculture and agri-food Canada. It's more through Health Canada. You talked about front of package labeling. I was glad that collectively we ended up in the right space on that one, on the exemption. Yep. Uh, you talk about environmental policies. Uh, it's almost through ECCC and health some of the most pressing issues are now coming through the agriculture sector and less through agriculture and agriculture. Yep, Canada. Absolutely. That's another dynamic that I think we have to address in terms of how we communicate to government, particularly because some of the folks that are in agriculture and agri-food Canada certainly have been to a farm. They might be farming background. They appreciate that. Maybe people on ECCC and Health Canada, a little bit less so. Uh, and Fair. so how do you square those things? I think that's an important dynamic. I think it's about how you communicate. Uh, I, was in, uh, I was in Saskatchewan in April as I continue to go to the well and say, and I look forward to coming to other places. Um, but I said to the group of stakeholders that were there at the time, uh, and I compare it to the oil and gas sector, for example, 
uh, because I see, I see real parallels between our oil and gas sector, energy sector, and agriculture. And I said, what a different narrative it would be uh, if we, I think this is something that government can work on, and, and I sit in the caucus and I'm not afraid to say it. There will be an oil and gas sector in 2050. Uh, yes, there will be a declining need as the world makes a transition, but it will be there. And we have a choice about whether or not we want Canada to be part of that conversation. And when we look at the emission reduction plan, I know that it hasn't landed very well in your province and certain times people see it as a threat to the industry. But we also need to make sure that Canada is competitive on emissions vis-a-vis -vis the oil and gas sector, right? There's other countries in the world, other jurisdictions, frankly, can almost stick a straw on the ground and the emissions associated with it are less. We, what a different narrative it would be if we said, look, we actually want to work with the industry to position you for continued success in 2050 because the oil and gas sector in Canada is so important. It matters in western uh, Vancouver Island, right through to Newfoundland and Labrador. There's many people I went to high school with that made their start and they're living in Alberta, either still live there now or indeed moved home and, and were able to kind of create and drive a family. The same thing we have to talk about in the piece of the agriculture, which is we're proud of what the agriculture sector represents. Uh, I do think there will be a lens undoubtedly where countries that have committed to being net neutral by 2050, they are going to have to impose some type of, uh, I don't want to say, they're going to have to encourage their domestic industry to make changes. Now you guys, grain growers, are already doing that in spades, you're continuing to drive that innovation. At a certain point, I think globally, perhaps it's idealistic, there is going to have to be some carbon adjustment at the border. There's going to have to be some uh, carbon pricing in a global sense. Now I know John might say the carbon tax is not their preferred option. I always like to tease him a little bit because I think the carbon pricing is actually inherently a conservative principle, which means let's price it at the market level and let's decide. <laughs> sure, fair <laughs> enough. Good job. I think it's it, it's actually encouraging the sector to continue to make strides, recognizing that there are inherent challenges and that the technology uh, is not always readily available to make it but that all along it's government working with the sector in order to be able to make Canadian agriculture some of the most sustainable in the world. I know that we're already doing a lot of that, but that's a, that's a communication narrative. There is always going to be tension. I don't, maybe John will say that you know, there's some utopian world where government and, and the industry are going to agree on everything. I don't think that's the case, but I think, I think, I think language and communication and, and narrative is extremely important to talk about why we're trying to get there which is, it's not to punish, it's to position for future success. Well, I mean, That's a yeah. long, long, yeah. here you go, John. I thought it was back and forth. How long is this back and forth? Oh. No, no. I, I agree with a lot of what he said, but there is, there is a, a diametrical problem within government and agriculture right now. So I would say that there's no question we have to deal with, with, with climate change and temperatures, whatever that, whatever that may be. But you, you touched on it, Brandon. You said, Agriculture is not the problem. Agriculture offers the solution. But in my argument, not only our government, but governments around the world are looking at agriculture as part of the problem rather than looking at them as part of the solution. Uh, your, the EU's farm to fork policy is a perfect example. The fact that the Net Zero Commission was started here in Canada without any agriculture representation is another good example, which brought along the Agriculture Carbon Alliance because you didn't feel you had a voice. So for to stop this, there must be that hand in hand where, hey, we're, we're talking about why we're doing this, but we're going to make you part of that conversation. We want your input on how we get there. You can't have an announcement at COP26 about fertilizer emissions reduction without talking to anyone first and then have to kind of back, a tr you know, well, we're not talking about use, we're talking about emissions. Well, if we had that conversation first, we could have had that announcement with a much better understanding from agriculture on what we meant. But our problem right now, and, I, and Cody talked about it, is, and the EU would be the same. It's amazing how you change. You know, we, we want 25% organic, we're taking 4% uh, of our agricultural land out of production until you hit a crisis. And then it's like, whoa, hey, uh, we can't do any of this. Let's go back to normal. Let's fire up the coal-fired power plants. Let's get back. You can have all the activism and all the ideal, ideological plans you want, but it has to be based on reality. Yeah. And eventually we will get there to, and all reach the goals we want to get there, but it has to be done hand in hand, ensuring that all of us are part of that conversation. And right now, my argument is we are not, and that is not the way to go. So I'd like to dive into this. I think this is a good segue to our last question. We, we went a while. 
Check, check your phone. Oh, yeah. your wife is calling. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <She's> <laughs> uh, but I think I'll, I'll wrap this into a couple of questions. Uh, or a couple of questions to one, I should say. One, we'll start with you. Cody, you sponsored at the Liberal Convention a couple of years ago a uh, policy motion, policy resolution to make Canada an agricultural superpower, which I appreciate. I'll, 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 uh, yeah, I'll appreciate. give him applause for that. Yeah, no, and actually, honestly, it was, yeah. it was, that was great. So I, I do appreciate that. I'd like to speak a little bit to that. But I'm going to roll this into another question, kind of what you were just talking about in terms of the EU farm to fork strategy. And so there's, it seems as though pandemic and all these realizations about food aside, which I think have manipulated or changed this viewpoint, we're, we're in a world right now, or in a Western world right now anyways, that has two diverging paths. One of which is the EU farm to fork strategy, and one of which has now, I guess, come under an umbrella of the US-led uh, Sustainable Productivity Growth Coalition. Right. Uh, and it, it seems as though Canada is stuck in the middle. And which is no man's land, more or less, right? So Canada signed on to the U.S. led product sustainable After some growth. hard and well, oh, come on, <laughs> easy on that. We're, 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 we're doing a nice nonpartisan <laughs> podcast here. I'll just say we're <laughs> encouraging to join. No, this but, group. but they are two different uh, viewpoints, right? Yeah. So there's that one, which I, I, I would say our members generally support, which is we produce a lot. We can always be more sustainable. We'll work towards that, but. Ultimately, producing the most amount of food on our best land to feed a growing world population is key. Versus the EU farm to fork strategy, which is is more about uh, less crop protection product use, less fertilizer use, and for a, a, a group of nations that went from food secure to now a major Im food importer is questionable. I would suggest, and Canada seems to be struggling to straddle both. Of, of working on, on climate change policies, environmental sustainability policies that emulate that, while also trying to, you know, when President Joe Biden says maybe Canada can grow some more, we're like, yeah, we'll grow some more. That's not the way the world works, but you know, yeah, like we're, we're stuck in the middle with nobody, and that's a tough spot to be. So where do we go from here? I guess is the question. Look, your your questions bleed into a million questions. So <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's the last one. I got one, got one shot of this. Okay, okay, <laughs> no problem. Um, look, a couple things. Uh, glad for the shout out on the on the policy. Um, the reason it was brought forward is we wanted in the liberal tent on that policy framework to make sure that there was a focus on agriculture and and all the intrinsic uh, value that it represents. We haven't talked on this podcast show yet. We haven't mentioned Ukraine. Um, but Ukraine and the consequences from the war in Eastern Europe uh, are going to have long-lasting impacts for agriculture here in Canada, but indeed food production around the world. Um, as I mentioned in the remarks just before we joined this podcast, uh, I feel we have an ethical and moral obligation to be there. And, and I applaud farmers across the country, grain and otherwise, uh, that are stepping up to make sure that we have that food production in, in you know, a global sense, because we are a global food player. And I think uh, we have to be looking at both ends of the telescope. And I'll get to your question on, on you know, the European versus the American model. Um, but, you know, we have to both be looking at ways that we can enhance domestic uh, food security, how we can shore up regional capacity. We're sitting right now in Nova Scotia, uh, in the province that is least food secure in the entire country. Uh, we are one, you know, bad, high tide away from being a peninsula uh, in the Federation. Um, and so, and we've lost a lot of that intrinsic processing value uh, that, that frankly other regions of the country have. So how can we focus on building that domestic capacity to not only feed ourselves, but we are a global <coughs> food superpower. You know, is there more to be done? Absolutely. You're speaking to a member of Parliament, I know John would agree, we can do so much more. Uh, but we are already, in the many senses, a global, global food superpower. How do we walk that line? Uh, again, call me the centrist in the room and the <laughs> ideal. <laughs> so, uh, I, look, I don't think it has to be one or the other. And I know that that is idealistic. I know that there are challenges, and I've mentioned that in terms of how we balance environmental programs, uh, environmental success versus food production. I will say I think the world has fundamentally changed since February 24th. Yep. The values in which we are placing and, and how different issues have shifted. Uh, I had said, for example, John, you were here. Uh, Anita Non would not have announced $6 billion for NORED 
if the Russians had invaded uh, Ukraine. Sure. Defense, food security, energy security have now, frankly, catapulted themselves up. And I think we can't just ignore that we have work on sustainability. And I know that no one in this room is suggesting that. So it is a mess. It is a messy middle ground, and it can't be one or the other. It has to be both. Those are going to be hard conversations. Those are going to be difficult, and we're not always going to agree what the best policy is. Um, but frankly, that is the pathway forward because it can't be just either all environmental with no regard to food production or reality, as John had said, and it can't just be complete food production without any emphasis on sustainability. So I really think it's in the middle. Now, I, I, I appreciate that it's an open question exactly what that parameters look like, but I think we just need to stay balanced and, and try to work with industry stakeholders like yourself to say, how can we continue to drive your goals that are already stated, but without compromising our food security? And I do think there's a path. I think it's driven by innovation. I think it's driven by research and science. That's how we've been able to, uh, I think it's double our production in the country over the last 30 years and, and really keep our emissions overall stagnant. You know, our emission intensity per unit has gone down. That's, we've done that in the oil and gas sector as well. We need to continue. 17%. There you go. You've got the number. So there's my long-winded... Uh, it's a good answer. Yeah. That's a good answer. I'll give John a final word to you before we, uh, we cut this off. Well, I'm, I'm going to be a little contrarian to what, uh, to what Cody said. Is I, don't, I don't think we have to stay in the middle. I, I think we have to pick a lane here. And, and I don't believe the farm to fork lane is the way that we should be going. And we, and I did joke, but we, we were, and I, I'm sure I can't speak for, for my liberal colleagues who are on the committee, but we were pushing the minister pretty hard to join what was an American-led prosperity growth, growth group. And we don't want to go down the farm to fork lane. Are there some things that we can do? Absolutely. But I, I think our challenge, um, or I believe our challenge right now is, is unfortunately agriculture is one of those, those portfolios that you have a lot of different ministers with their fingers in the pot. And, and I would argue, I, I, would argue and I, I, I believe I'm pretty fair here, so unfortunately we have the Minister of, of Health and the Minister of Climate Change, Environment and Climate Change, pushing too much of the policy that is affecting agriculture, without agriculture being the one that's actually driving that, that, uh, that agenda, that policy. Because even with that American-led, and it, well, I said we got to pick a lane here, we have to also look at who is our number one trading partner, but also our number one competitor, the United States. Do we really want to be offside on policy, regulation, agenda, with our number one trading partner and also competitor, and pick pick with the EU, which I think is going in a very dangerous and exp they are now as you said they are food insecure, but also their grocery prices are are out of control. I was in Germany with the minister a couple of months ago, speaking with some farmers in, in Germany. One was an MP, uh, and he said it's it's impossible for them to to stay in business. We're seeing what's going on in the Netherlands right now with, with farmers pressing back, saying you know we we can't we can't do this. So I, I don't believe this is a middle. I think we have to pick a lane here. And just because we're saying uh, prosperity and growth and increasing yield, it doesn't mean that we're abandoning you know, solid environmental stewardship. Like We've always done that. And that's, I think, the misnomer here, is that there's some misunderstanding that we're not already doing everything we possibly can. We're always striving to be better. As Cody said, we've improved yield by 60% in the last two decades while still keeping our input costs fairly, fairly level, in many cases um, reducing them. So, I don't believe the middle lane is the way to go. We need to pick a side, uh, and and I think unfortunately we have the Minister of Environment, and Climate Change, and the Minister of Health driving too much of this. And the key to that is CFIA and PMRA do not have competitiveness or economic impact no. in their mandates. That needs to be a general. One more thing. One more. One more. <laughs> one more. <laughs> we ended. We ended on division. But I didn't want he's, to. He's, yeah. in, he's in government. He's yeah, allowed to. Yeah, That's the last word here, buddy. Look, I think John. Uh, it's ironic that you have a conservative saying we have to pick a lane, and you have a centrist liberal saying we have to try to find a money middle. I mean, that's what we expected. I think, I think what John and I would both agree, and we'll end on a happy note, is that there is, especially in a world where government is going to have to be very prudent in our fiscal expenditure because of what we're seeing around inflation, because yep. of the war in Ukraine, because of the impacts of COVID, uh, that regulatory reform and uh, legislative changes that don't cost money but can drive important innovation in the sector, like the gene editing that we've talked about with Health Canada, will be extremely important. So uh, John and I might differ a little bit in where our broader views go, but I think at the end what you hope you've heard is that we both 
fully support what you guys are doing. Thank you for having us here. And uh, we'll both we'll, we'll toast to regulatory Cheers. reform. Cheers. 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 Seven or eight years. <laughs> <laughs> so I got an idea for next Maybe time. start that first. I got, I got an idea. Next one's at 11 p.m. Right? <laughs> well, we'll see what we can come up with. But thank you guys so much. As I said earlier, you, you're both steadfast advocates, whether it be mushy middle or pick a lane, it doesn't really matter. You're both just solid. You're, you're truly two of the good ones. And, there, and I have worked in politics, there are good and bad ones, I'll say it frankly. Yeah. You are two of the good ones, and I'm happy to say that you're both on Team Agriculture. Despite being from different sides of the aisles, I can't, I, I can't say enough how much I appreciate uh, the work you guys do and your relationship with us, and, and I, I know and hope that that will continue. So thank you guys so much for joining me, and thank you to Alexander Keats. Yeah. Uh, Alexander, yeah, that was a round of applause for Alexander. I always knew it was a good beer, but that was just me as a beer drinker. Yeah. And then I get here, this fantastic tour, this fantastic space. If you're coming to Halifax, uh, come here for a tour, come here for a taste, come here for an experience of East Coast hospitality. It really is second to none. So, I, and, and obviously, thank you to all of those of you that uh, have listened uh, verbally, visually, whatever you've done uh, to enjoy this live. Uh, for First attempt at a live, live stream. Uh, I feel bad. We're getting our beers refilled and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that. I don't feel that bad. No, no right. bad you're after. But, but thank you all for listening. This has been a real pleasure. I, again, thank you guys so much for joining us. It's, it's been fantastic. And Thanks. Good to see you. We'll see you in Ottawa. I'm not too much in the future, fellas. Oh, well, not that sure. fast. Uh, not that fast. We'll see you in Sam Pete. Yeah, we'll all right. Thanks, everybody. Get out there and enjoy some great Canadian beer. Take care. Yahoo.